Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to Cavern's webinar, California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, a CISO's Perspective. We'll start in about 90 seconds or so. We still have people uh, beeping into the system, so please stand by. We'll start in about 45 seconds, so please stand by. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Welcome to Cavern's webinar, California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, a CISO's Perspective. We have with us today Joe Cusick, who's Cavern's Chief Security Officer, and he brings to us over 20 years of real-life enterprise and security of experience including managing positions at the likes of Citigroup, CA Technologies, General Motors, and most recently, Verizon. So Joe, welcome to our webinar this morning. Thank you. Look forward to having this discussion. So I'm sure a number of you have a number of questions out there, the least of which is, what is CCPA? Why does it matter? What are some of the moving parts? When does it take effect? What am I going to have to do, and how does it impact, you know, how I carry out my day-to-day -day business? Uh, Joe will be answering these questions and more. And if you have your own questions, please enter them into your viewer portal. We'll answer them as they come in. And last but not least, we have a vote. Are you subject to CCPA? If you know already you are, so go ahead and vote yes. If you're not sure right now, Wait until later on in the webinar when you learn more, and then you can give a more informed vote. So with that, Joe, you know, in, in a nutshell, what is the CCPA of 2018? Well, it's really the first U.S. Uh, consumer privacy law that's been introduced outside of federally regulated entities. Um, so. You know, it provides rights to the consumer over their data, and specifically over the last 12 months of their data, in terms of what's kept and how it, you know, and how it's used. Um, it requires businesses to disclose to the consumer, you know, information that they're storing and what they're using it for, and that's all they can use that information for. Uh, it was whatever they disclosed that that usage would be. It also includes third-party providers in terms of you have to notify them in terms of what categories of third-party providers you've been providing the data to and their names. So this way the consumers know where their information has gone. Um, beyond that, businesses have to make it easier for consumers to request their information. We'll discuss that in the requirements later on. You know, businesses also have to delete personal information based on consumer requests that, that does an opt-out option. In addition to that, consumers are responsible can restrict business from selling their personal information. So that that's, you know, giving the consumer more control. Uh, beyond that, it also says, look, if a consumer opts out, you can't charge a different price for the same service to that consumer just because they've opted out. Um, beyond that, businesses, you know, can't really sell consumer data on minors unless they have the appropriate opt-in selected. So, they need to have um, parents or or guardians to opt those those minors into the program um, before that data can be utilized. 
It also provides the California Attorney General with the power to enforce this act against businesses should there be violations. Uh, and it goes into effect in January 1st, 2020. So Joe, it sounds like, you know, it's a lot of work and a lot of moving parts. So what, why do we even need it then? Well, you know, first, the California Constitution grants the right of privacy. It was an amendment done, I believe, back in the 1980s. Um, beyond that, also the existing laws today, you know, for confidential, uh, you know, of consumer information is primarily related to notification of security breaches. Um, and and what's been happening is companies have been leveraging this consumer information a lot of times without the consumer really understanding why it's being used for financial benefit. Um, and, and a lot of times the usage isn't aligned to what the consumer's understanding was when he shared that information with the business. You know, some examples of this would be you have internet service providers that can provide value-added services, also referred to over the top, um, to consumers. They throw, you know, social media, advertising, online retailers, and also non-banks. I mean, the banks are regulated um, extensively through uh, Grand Leach Biley Act, but non-banks don't have the same scenario. And then prior to law, consumers really had very little control of their information. You know, if, if it was a federally regulated entity, we'll cover that a little bit later, um, there was control there, but the, outside of that, consumers really didn't have any say in terms of what's happened to their information. And so that's what's driving some of this change. So Joe, based on uh, you know what you just presented, our, our first question came in, and it's as follows: uh, Can you offer? Can you, being a you know an online company, offer California consumers incentives, i.e., lower prices? That would be nice if they openly agree to opt in. So. Yes, the the law does provide the capability to to offer incentives to consumers that uh, that choose. Well, first of all, it's an automatic opt-in scenario. The only people that have to so so it's an opt-out, right? So everybody is considered to be included. So you don't uh, the opt-in is just for the the um, the consumers are under 16 years of age. Now you. You can also still provide financial incentives to get consumers to stay um, and not opt out, right? Because they don't have to opt in, um, but to make sure that they're not going to opt out, you you can provide them some incentives. Okay, no, that's good. So, you know, on the back of uh, the, the previous question, uh, you talk about consumers, we talk about businesses. Who who exactly is impacted? Yes, uh, let me go over that. So every, everybody who's a permanent resident of the state of California, uh, and it also applies to those residents, even if they leave the state, um, so you might have an iPhone or some other type of device that may capture data in the state of California, so that's still covered even when you leave the state. So if you have a mobile app running on your, on your um, phone and it captures data and you're in the state of California, and then you leave the state of California and it tries to take that data, and utilize it elsewhere, that falls within the scope. So consumers, you know, of the state of California that are permanent residents, it, 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 it directly covers them, and it covers those same people when they leave the state with the data that was collected from them in the state of California. Now, in related to the businesses, for a business, this, this deals with four profit businesses, sole proprietors, partnerships, limited liability, uh, companies, corporations, other legal entities, that they have to fall in, in certain categories, in at least one of these categories. So one, their revenue is $25 million or more. Um, two, they process personal information for 50,000 or more California residents, uh, households or devices every year. Now, I, I highlight the word devices because I think a lot of times people don't 
understand that little part because a device can be very simple. It can be, you know, you could be using a, a vehicle diagnostics information. You could be using a mobile phone. You could be providing people USB sticks. So all that can be added together to get you to that 50,000 limit where you're now included. Um, beyond, you know, the, another scenario is that you actually generate 50% of your gross revenue by selling personal information. So if you're a data broker and you collect data and resell it, then obviously that's going to come into play for you. And, and also, any entity that controls or is controlled by a business that has the power exercising controlling influence over the management of the company. So that will become another scenario where, especially in California, you have a lot of uh, companies that do have control of other of other entities because you know they they make investments in them they take ownership stakes so you'll have to look into that as carefully as well the la um, the last group is data providers right so, uh, so data service providers are going to clearly be in scope here and there's a lot of focus with them within this uh, regulation as as it goes forward Okay, so Joe, two questions that, that came in, and one I didn't really realize the ramifications of this. It, it goes into effect January 1st, 2020, but it says data going back 12 months. Does that mean everything collected in 2019 is, is going to be in scope? And then a, a second, probably simpler question, is that $25 million in revenues only California or, or worldwide? So, um, so let me take the first question, which is uh, the, the the 12 months of data. So if you, so, once this goes in effect, January 1st of 2020, you only have 2019 data, um, and so that has to be in scope because it's the data you have. So once once the law goes into effect, 12 months prior data, you know you can immediately be partitioned. You know, you could get a request from a consumer to say, what data do you have of me? And then you would have to tell them, this is the data I have from you from 2019. And, you know, then the consumer has the right to say, I don't want you to keep it I or I don't want you to sell it. So at that point, you know, 2019 data will be in scope because the law will be in effect and you already capture that data. And as of January 1st, you'll be required to report on it. Now, uh, related to the revenues, it is um, um, the focus of the law is California, so the focus of the revenue is California revenue. Thank you. But that that uh, twelve uh, month uh, you know look back is is kind of interesting because what we're saying is that organizations now really have September, October, November, December, one hundred and twenty days to actually get their data in order, partition it if, if required, and, and be ready to present it, um, you know, 16 months from now. It's very interesting. So um, the, the next question, uh, you know, does a business need to collect consumer data, and, and, and why? Well, first, uh, no, not any business. Uh, you know, any business can elect not to store consumer data and, you know, avoid compliance. But it's a gray area, right? Because even if I choose not to collect anything, I'm still going to have to deal with parts of the law that's going to require me to update my consumer privacy statements, inform the consumers uh, that that the company doesn't store their data or sell their data. So, you know, indirectly, even if I'm not collecting the data, um, there'll be some gray area of compliance required because I'll have to still update my consumer privacy statements. Um, in addition to that, uh, businesses that do one-time transactions with consumers, they can ex be excluded as long as they don't save the, cu cons the customer-specific data. So if, if um, I'm doing activities with you and I'm not keeping your information, um, at that point there's not going to be a, a requirement, again, that I maintain it, but the gray areas still come into play that I'll have to provide notification that I'm not maintaining it. Um, but the burden is going to really be on, on many of the consumers that don't use consumer data to sell it to, you know, to, you know, that they only use it for their internal purposes, such as delivering goods, providing services to them, uh, but they're not selling the data. 
Um, so some examples here is your uh, brick and mortar retail business, uh, food establishments, uh, supermarkets, movie theaters that offer memberships for discounts. They're going to be captured in this, provided they, they meet the burden of uh, 50,000 individuals or 25 million in revenue. Um, toll uh, pay systems, if, if there is for profit, and some of these do operate at a profit, as well as gas station loyalty cards. So, you know, on the back of that question, uh, you know, if a consumer opts out, what, what can an organization, what can an enterprise or a business keep then? So, um, if it can, if a, you know, uh, so while a consumer can ask to opt out um, of that, their information, uh, the, um, the information can still be kept if it's required for me to maintain the business relationship. So um, if, I, if I'm a gas supplier and, and I need to provide you gas to your residence or, um, uh, you know, I provide you a phone service, I need to know what your physical address is. Uh, same thing with uh, other businesses. So in that case, I can still maintain the information. In the case of I have an ongoing business relationship for you to provide service that requires having your specific information. Um, also, should my business experience, you know, security instances or there's some type of fraudulent or illegal activity that I need to maintain that information for, uh, you know, to take forward to a court for prosecution purposes, then I can maintain that information even though you've asked that it be removed. Um, I can also utilize it when I have um, to help identify and resolve errors uh, because something's not working properly. So when, when I put in your name, your address, uh, you know, I have an error uh, with the system processing, I can keep it to utilize it to repair that because perhaps there's something specific to your name that's causing that issue. Um, beyond, sorry, beyond that, you know, obviously, uh, free speech. So just because you want to remove your data, but if it's going to impair somebody else's free speech uh, or their ability to have free speech, then now be reasons why we can't remove that uh, information. Also, you have to comply with the California Electronic Com uh, Communications Privacy Act. Um, so where that requires the information, we can't delete it. Um, beyond that, um, if, the, if the consumer has already inf provided informed consent to participate in public or peer-reviewed scientific, historical, statistical research that's in the public interest, um, and as long as the data is being maintained in an ethical uh, manner conforming to privacy laws, then the business doesn't have to delete that data if it will invalidate the research uh, or impair the the research results. Um, in addition, um, if it's uh, I can the data can be maintained uh, based on the consumer's relationship. If it's only utilized for that, which is similar to the, the ongoing business tran uh, transaction activity that I mentioned to begin with, um, and also if there's you know you have to comply with legal obligations. So if there's a court order, maintain all data because this is being investigated you know, um, then you have to maintain it. Um, and, you know, if you're using customer information internally only in a lawful manner, um, then you can continue to utilize that, um, if, if provided that it's being used in the context of how it serves our consumer. Okay, so let, let's get into a couple of uh, comparative things where we'll look at other privacy regulations, we'll look at GDPR. So first of all, um, does it su supersede any, anything that's in existence today in, in the state of California or something on the federal level that's applicable to citizens in California? So it's, it's a state law, so it, you know, the federal laws are not impacted. Um, by um, the uh, CCPA. Uh, you know, the specific laws that are called out and mentioned within the act that are not, you know, the are not subject to it are graham leach Bly Act, which was generally known as the first U.S. privacy law, extensively used in financial services, 
uh, and insurance um, in terms of privacy of the customer data. Also, the um, uh, you know health information portability and accountability act, which is HIPAA, um, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, which is primarily what the uh, consumer rating firms are are regulated by. Also within the education space, you have the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and then you also have the uh, Drivers Privacy Protection Act. Uh, would, so these are all federal laws that are specifically named within the legislation that said that, that if you're subject to these, then obviously, um, you know, the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act does not apply. Beyond that, uh, there are some California laws that are not impacted. So you have a California Electronics Communication Privacy Act, and you also have a California Confidentiality of Medical Information Act. So there's no impact to those regulations within the state of California uh, with the introduction of this new law, uh, and it was specifically called out. So on the back of that, uh, who's not impacted? So. Uh, as I uh, indicated, those organizations, and I alluded to that earlier, so you have GLEPA, which is the Grand Wage Flyway Act, which are financial institutions, um, so banks, credit unions, savings uh, banks, uh, consumer finance firms, uh, HIPAA, uh, which would be uh, health care organizations, both pay, uh, providers, which is to be medical, you know, establishments that provide services to you, whether they be doctor's offices, whether it be um, x-ray firms, whether it be flood drawing organizations and the payers, the insurance carriers associated with that, um, and also, um, as I said, the consumer credit rating agencies, because they're covered under um, uh, the Fair Credit uh, Reporting Act, and educational institutions, and also California State Department of Motor Vehicles, since they are covered under both the federal uh, DDPA and also the California DDPA. Um. So we've, we've had a lot of, uh, you know, press coverage on, on CCPA, and a lot of people are calling it, you know, California's uh, version of uh, GDPR uh, out of the European Union. So next two questions, uh, how is it similar and, and how does it differ from uh, GDPR? Okay. So. First, if you, if you look at uh, the similarities, you, you look at access. So um, access to information is covered by both of them. That's, so that's a similarity. Disclosure of the purpose of the information is covered by, by both uh, GDPR and the CCPA. Um, in addition, the, the ability to delete the information is covered by both. Um, the opportunity to opt out. Uh, of the information. So in, in GDPR is the case of direct marketing, in the case of CCPA of selling the information. Um, it also goes into what what is your personal information and and you know so that you clearly understand what it is. I think that what a lot of people don't understand about GD, GDPR, it applies to all natural persons. So if I'm a US citizen in a European Union country, then I'm, you know, my data at that point becomes subject to GDPR, even though I'm not a, a Europe, uh, EU citizen. Um, the other thing would be in terms of, um, you know, the consumer, um, and and this is what I just alluded to. It was specifically in terms of the natural person doesn't have to be a citizen of the EU to be included in it. But California is very specific. You must be a resident of California, not just a temporary or trans or there for transient purposes. So um, they both name an individual, um, a human individual, but they, they have different confines to it um, from that perspective. Um, in terms of the difference, um, that you had asked about. So penalty is different. So obviously, when you're dealing with uh, business on the GDPR, it could be up to 4% 4, 4 of worldwide revenue, uh, annual revenue, or 20 million, whichever one is greater. So for a lot of large organizations, um, uh, 20 million euros, I think. Um, 
you know, worldwide revenue is always going to be a higher number for those companies. Related to uh, the California uh, Consumer Privacy Act, um, it's against the business or the data processor. Uh, per consumer record, it would be up to $7,500 for a willful action. Um, and, you know, for minors in their action, it's not remediated, would be between $100 and $750 per consumer. Beyond that, you know, um, as I said, in the European Union, it's all natural people, regardless of where, what country they're citizens of, but they're in the European Union at the time that the data is collected, where in California, specific to California residents. Um, you know, and I think I cover location in that regard. Consent, ch uh, ch child age of consent is also different between the two. California is very strict, 16. In GDPR, it allows each European Union country to choose the age. So the age in Spain is 14, um, and so it's a variable age uh, when you're dealing with GDPR in the European Union. Um, definitions of security processing requirement. So in GDPR, they're very specific in terms of protecting the data, how you protect protect the data. But when you're dealing with CCPA, they are not very specific about um, that, that activity. What they are focused on is mostly once the consumer selects to have their information removed, that you de-identify that data and that you ensure that the data can't be re-identified. So, so there are Differences from that perspective, where there's much more focus in California in, in regards of removing the data and making sure that nobody else can look at the data uh, once it's removed. Um, and there's also no requirements for a data private protection officer uh, within California uh, Consumer Privacy Act compared to GDPR, which requires um, a, a data protection officer and also lays out what their requirements or the duties are. Um, and then related to consumer notification of breach, um, so it is covered within GDPR, but it's not specifically covered within CCPA. So CCPA is not focused on on, on the breach of data. Uh, so that's where you have a major difference between the two of them. Um, and the scope of the data, um, it's just consumer data, um, but when you're dealing with the GDPR, it includes employer data as well. So you can also say, hey, I want you to forget that I was an employee of your company or maintain data on that information with GDPR, which that's not in the scope of um, CCPA. So Joe, um, you may have just answered this question. One came in, does CCPA govern protection of information about employees who are residents of California? I think you answered that, but the, the answer is no, correct? That is correct. So that so it does not cover employees. It only covers consumers. And that, like I said, was one of the major differences between GDPR. Uh, and then a, looking ahead to this question, uh, another one came in. Uh, steps to comply with CCPA, and one question came in from the audience. How will compliance be audited? Is it going to be a validation or certification? like PCI, or is, or is it something different? So if you can answer that in the context of this question, it would be great. So the, um, the compliance hasn't been defined uh, to date because it requires that, uh, first it requires you to provide notification that, um, you know, if the, the law requires that a consumer be able to see what data they have. And it's very specific that those things have to be established. You have to have, a, um, you know, and I'll cover that later on, but I'll just quickly mention it. You have to have a toll-free number set up. You have to make notification, you know, have to make accessibility available through your website. You have to update your um, consumer privacy statements. So, so it's very specific in terms of some of the compliance aspects of it. Now, when somebody believes that there would be a breach, you know, a breach of the law in terms of their data um, not being used appropriately, then the law is very specific. It's up to the attorney general to act on it. First, you would provide a company time to remediate. 
failure to remediate, then the California Attorney General would have the um, responsibility to act on it and take that case forward uh, against the individual. So, you know, so from that perspective, the, the first part of it is very clear because it's very visible. You know, you have your 800, your 1-800 uh, toll-free number set up. You have, you know, your privacy statement updated and it has to be updated every 12 months. And so, so, so the law is very particular in terms of things you need to do to comply that, that are very quickly visible to see if they're done or not. But there's not like a the similar process of where you go in and you actually do a PCI compliance. Um, so that's not been defined in the law. The Attorney General does have the next 16 months to put in procedures um, and within the law, and that's towards the end of the regulatory statute, but there is no uh, mandatory compliance test that has to be done at this point. Okay, so the steps comply? I'm sorry? The steps to comply now. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. I didn't know if you were going to ask me another question. So in terms of how you comply, so so this gets into, uh, you know, you have to update your consumer privacy policies and your end user agreements, and it has to be done at least once every 12 months. So that, that's going to be a key item um, to do. In addition, you're going to have to incorporate new business processes, right? You're going to have to document where the consumer data is stored, who is it transmitted to, and all the uses of that data. You'll also have to update your, your data service provider agreements to make sure that they're going to comply with CCPA. Um, specifically, the focus here is going to be on the ability to de-identify the data uh, and then make sure that it's, that it's not re-identifiable. As I mentioned, you have to have that toll-free phone number um, established so that the consumers can request their information. You also have to be able to authenticate the consumers, um, and that's an area that there's some law that's defined in that, and you know, some more clarification will be coming out on that. But uh, you also be, you know, track the number of consumer requests in the, in the past 12 months, because the consumer can make two requests beyond that, and the business is allowed to charge if the consumer makes more requests. Um, and then you also have to, within your business process, you know, maintain, you know, a tracking mechanism. So I got the request, and then within 45 days of, cons of authenticating the consumer of their request, I have to provide the data. There is an option that you can extend that time, but you also have to make that extension notification prior to that 45 day. Um, you also have to update the website. Uh, to address the requirements, you know, as I said, there has to be a clear and conspicuous link to the business's internet uh, on the business's uh, internet homepage with the title. These are spelled out. These are exact words that must be used. Do not sell my personal information, and then you would, you know, then the consumer would have the opportunity to click on that and go forward to opt out of selling that information. Uh, also, the consumer has to have a password protected account so that they can go in and make their request as well as uh, what's unique here is that the consumer can also have an authorized representative do on their behalf. Um, so that's another thing that has to be addressed as well. And then from a cybersecurity perspective, you have to make sure you have a well-implemented a well-defined security program, you know, you want to be following a, a program structure that you're going to be comfortable defending. They do not specify any specific program requirements or structure to follow, so that's why I'm recommending that you have a well-established one in place that you utilize. One of the key things I think is going to be a lot of the work is encrypting all the consumer data at rest. Now, there's not a requirement per se to do that. That's what I'm putting in there as what I feel you'll have to do to prevent inappropriate usage. Otherwise, you could be subject to, you know, was the data protected? Did the database administrators have access to the data? Did other people have access to the data? You know, the operations people. But if you have all the data, all the consumer data encrypted at rest, that'll alleviate the burden of proving that there wasn't anything inappropriately used. Otherwise, you'll have to do a lot more activities and monitoring. Um, to pr 
to provide that proof. In addition, you'll have to implement procedures to de-identify consumer data um, and also to prevent its re-identification. So once you've de-identified a consumer, how do we maintain that so that that data doesn't get re-identified? So those are going to be major burdens that I believe organizations will undertake besides changing their, their business processes and updating their websites. So Joe, relating to uh, an earlier question, and I, I think you sort of touched on involving data breach notification. In California, if I uh, remember, in most cases there's a 72-hour uh, guideline, um, and I wouldn't anticipate that CCPA is going to change any of that, correct? That's correct. Like I said, within CCPA, they didn't cover data, uh, data breach notification, so there's no change to any existing laws that are in place for that. Okay, great. So let's go uh, to you know the the CISO and the, and the CISO. You know what what's new? What what are the new responsibilities? What what do they have to watch out for? So the consumer privacy is is expanded. Uh, so it covers products, services that are obtained or considers uh, or or are purchasing or consumer history or tendencies. So. So this greatly expands what you need to start to protect, right? Um, because now it's their history, their tendencies that you're going to protect. And in addition to that, the definition of biometric information is extremely broad, you know, from individuals, physiological, biological, behavior characteristics, um, including DNA, um, and, and, be, and, and should this be combined with other things to establish individual identity. It also talks about the imagery of the uh, iris, the retina, um, fingerprint, face, hand, palm, uh, vein pattern, and voice recordings. Um, you know that can, that can be extracted to identify. You. It includes keystroke patterns and rhythms, um, as well as uh, you know sleep, health, exercise. So the amount of data that's incorporated to identify the individual is much greater than what anybody has had to deal with in the past. Um, also, it covers geo, geolocation data. So that also starts to expand upon um, other information that traditionally hasn't been, you know, uh, protected. Um, and as I said, you know, the best thing always to do is to encrypt this data. And like I said, this covers much greater than what we've been encrypting in the past. We may have encrypted social security numbers, may have encrypted credit card numbers, but a lot of this other information has never been looked to be encrypted before. Um, audio, uh, audio, electronic, visual, thermal, um, and an also fact, uh, factory and other uh, similar information. Um, it goes on to your personal and employment related information as well. So um, while it doesn't give the employee the same, it doesn't give the employees the same right, but it still says if I as a consumer post my professional or information related information in different locations, um, LinkedIn could be one, right? Uh, or even into that company as, as an applicant database or into any of the other um, employment sites, this now comes into scope that I have to deal with. Um, also, any educational information that wasn't already covered, uh, that you know, that was not already covered by the uh, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act comes into scope as well to the equation. Um, the law also restricts the business from storing that personal information when the, con when the consumer is in California and then extracting elsewhere. So specific to this would be, like I mentioned early on, you can have a mobile phone or you can have a, a tablet or a reader where, you know, that data is there, it was collected in California, and then you might want to upload it back into your system. Um, but since it was collected in California, you, you know, it becomes protected. Even if the, I leave California, I apply to, you know, I'm a California, you know, I live in San Francisco, I fly to Chicago to work, and then in the mobile apps like, oh, he's out of California. I still can't take that data because it was really from a California citizen. Uh, so, Joe, uh, one, oh, you, uh, uh, one quick question before you go on to the devices. Um, an earlier question, and, and you, you sort of touched on it, but going in more detail, 
Is sharing data the same as selling data, i.e., sharing mailing lists of Californians for analysis and return of analytical results? So in terms of uh, sharing data, so if I'm sharing your data uh, and I've given it to somebody that's going to use it, so they become a, 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 they become a data processor of that data, right? I still have to notify the consumer that I gave your data to another individual. Um, you now, if it's associated to the, to my business, it's it's a data it's a data service provider. But if I'm going to give my data, if I'm going to give the data to another to another organization for a different purpose, then first of all, I don't have that permission because it wasn't in my statement, right? So within my consumer privacy statements, I would have had to say that I am giving this data you know, sharing my mailing list with somebody else for them to use. If I don't state that, then that's not an explicit use of the data that I told the consumer about, so I can't give that data. So if I'm not selling the data but just sharing the data, I still need to state that within my privacy statements up front that I may share my data, share the data I have about this consumer to XYZ. If I don't, then it's not an explicit known case that I've that I've told to that consumer, so I can't share the data. So, so yes, selling and sharing are two different things, but I can't share data that I haven't disclosed to the consumer as part of my privacy statement to say this is something that I may do. So I just can't arbitrarily just share data that I didn't previously identify to the consumer. Because in that particular case, what would have to happen is I would have to specifically do an opt-in. I would have to reach out to the consumer and say, this wasn't in my privacy statement, but I want to share my data with XYZ and, and get their approval to do that. Um, so, so that's where the difference would be if I didn't have it in my statement to, to, to be an opt-out scenario. So if I don't that, want that to... Relates to the, that relates to the controversy uh, that we're seeing out here about uh, Google and Google Maps and you know, recording your stuff when you're actually not actively using the application and sharing it with third parties. That would hit home there, wouldn't it? Yes, and actually, in the California Consumer Privacy Act, they specifically call out the issues that happen with Cambridge Analytics. So that's mm -hmm. in the legislation. Is yeah, the reason why they went forward with with creating this legislation. So let's talk about devices. That's an area that people sometimes misunderstand, and you know just how broad the reach of CCPA is here. Yeah, so um, when we get to the devices, yeah, obviously mobile phones, everybody would think of, uh, smart watches you would think of, tablets, laptops you would think of, readers like Kindle you would think of, USB sticks you may or may not think of, right? Uh, but that one, is, depending, if I'm giving out 50,000 or my business does more than 25 million and then I, and I use that to collect data. Um, you know, vehicle diagnostic information, so, you know, like uh, a company called Verizon sells a product called Hum, um, and there's other products in the market as well. Uh, navigation devices, if they should capture your information. And remember, geolocation is also included within the scope of, of, of the law. The other thing that will become more um, common as we go forward but it's still in the infancy is smart applications, right? So as you start to get refrigerators, washing machines, uh, need for uh, home heating, cooling controls, uh, these devices will become in scope based on the company size or number of devices they've sold in terms of what it knows about you specifically um, uh, and, what it, and, and what it shares with that information and whether the consumer wants that information to be shareable. Uh, same with home security like ADT uh, be an example, and also personal assistance um, that, you know, very close to a lot of, a lot of mobile apps, that, you know, mobile phones that we have today, but they themselves, um, you know, may operate differently, you know, home-based unit um, in terms of what it can, can't do, and, and the requirements on that. So I, so I think this is going to be broad reaching because they specifically called out devices um, that you need to pay attention to that aspect of it. So Joe, in, in closing, we're, we're looking at the votes from the audience and it's uh, interesting, you know, 43% say yes, 6% no, 
Fifty percent not sure. So what would some of your, your parting words be to the, the audience here in terms of how to you know, get sure or, or you know, your yes or no and, and what next steps to, to take? Well, you, you know, I, hopefully today I provided some additional focus items that you may not have looked at or thought about. Um, but if you do business in, in, in the state of California, or you have an entity that does business in the state of California, um, that would definitely require you to do a, a deeper dive. Um, now, if you're an online business, um, you know, and you sell to people in California, um, again, I would strongly suggest that you look at this um, deeper and drill into it. Um, I think that there will be more clarity coming out from uh, the California Attorney General's office uh, in the next few months that will guide this because that's also a requirement of the law that they would you know uh, provide some additional guidance as as we move forward with this um, so from that perspective um, if like I said if you, if you do business with California consumers I would strongly advise you that you look at this closely um, if, and you know and you know especially if you meet the criteria that you have revenue of over 25 million or you have, you know, over 50,000 devices within the state of California, those would be good guides to say, we're probably going to need to look into this deeper um, and, and worry about whether we are actually going to um, be entangled in this, you know, either directly or indirectly because the consumer can still bring, you know, uh, an issue against you. Um, I think that if you don't collect consumer data, the best bet is to go to your um, privacy statements online and update that to say you don't collect consumer data regardless if you're operating in California or not because you know I think that will just help you. I also think it would help you uh, to update any end user agreements if you don't collect consumer data to clearly state that uh, whether you're operating in California or not because I just think that those would be the key things to be focused on. Uh, to okay, Joe, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for your, for your insight there and so I'd invite anyone that's uh, watching this to go to a landing page we created. Uh, Joe created two very uh, well thought out uh, blogs on CCPA that are published. Uh, the presentation slides and answers, questions and answers will be published as well as later today the complete um, you know, voice track of the webinar. It's also obviously available on Bright Talk. So Joe, thanks again for your time today and I Hope it was a learning experience for everyone involved. Thanks again.